the post-war nuclear age transformed submarine technology. Not only were submarines designed to carry and fire nuclear weapons, nuclear power was used to propel them huge distances at high speed. The first nuclear-powered submarine was the USS Nautilus. US President Harry Truman signed his name onto the vessel's keel at a ceremony in 1952, and the submarine was constructed at the electric boat's shipyard in Connecticut. Much of the research for the craft's atomic power plant was carried out at the National Reactor Test Center in Idaho. A full-size duplicate of the Nautilus engine was constructed and tested. On the 30th of September 1954, First Lady Mamie Eisenhower christened the hull of the newly commissioned Nautilus. Doctor, this uh, simplified diagram of the USS Nautilus, the world's first atomic fire The Sea Wolf was the second the nuclear submarine commissioned by the US Navy. It was the first and only submarine built with a liquid metal nuclear reactor. The liquid sodium plant was more efficient than a water-cooled reactor, but potentially more dangerous for the ship and crew. Testing of the power plant took place at KAPL, the Knowles Atomic Power Laboratory, operated by General Electric. Hundreds of nuclear scientists developed a full-sized nuclear reactor to observe the chain reaction of nuclear fission that would be used to power the giant submarine. Both the Nautilus and the Sea Wolf were huge steps forward for the nuclear industry. Unlike nuclear-powered aircraft, Craft, nuclear powered subs became a viable proposition, and the technology is still used today. A documentary produced by the California Academy of Sciences in 1956 enlisted renowned submariner Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz to explain the principles of submarine operations. Well, the submarine has two systems of awesome. On the surface, she uses her diesel engines, which can generate about 6,500 horsepower and propel her at a speed of about 20 knots. For surface submersion, uh, surface propulsion, she has enormous storage batteries all along the keel here, which produce power for driving her submerged. Well, in other words, then, uh, if uh, you didn't have one of these snorkels and you wanted to go um, below the water, then you'd have to use the batteries for that uh, sort of uh, work. That's correct. Here's the Admiral the also demonstrated how periscopes right operate. The, uh, Right in the camera, uh, you have a cutaway model there. Perhaps you could demonstrate how this periscope operates. Uh. Well, this cutaway model will show sufficiently well the principles of the periscope. In the submarine, the periscope is a 40-foot steel tube. The commanding officer looks into this prism here, and the line of sight goes up and strikes this prism here, and so on out to the floor of uh, to the surface of the ocean. This prism may also be tilted so that you can search the sky for planes. Well, suppose we go now back to the training facility of Mare Island and see how the uh, periscope would actually work. And here we see uh, Lieutenant Commander D.T. Morris going through a periscope drill. And the command, of course, is up periscope. The skipper's first duty, when, as soon as the periscope comes above water, is to make a full 360-degree sweep of the horizon, to scan the earth off of the surface of the sea in all directions. He then focuses on his target. The next command we will hear is range mark, and following that, bearing mark. <clears throat> At this, uh, uh, co these commands, the assistant approach officer, in this case, Lieutenant Ware, takes note of the range to the target and her bearing on the azimuth circle. <clears throat> a good sonar operator can tell the difference between the propeller sounds of a carrier and those of a destroyer. Mm -hmm. and of course, we should mention that the sonar system also is able to send out uh, supersonic waves, and those go out and hit an object and bounce back to the submarine. And by the interval of time elapsed, from the time they leave the ship until they come back, we can calculate the range. Just how far away that object might be. Well, suppose we listen to some of the things we might hear from a submarine if, uh, for example, we were listening to a commercial ship, such as a freighter the uh, sort of a beat that we would hear from the propellers. 
Then followed by the beat of a faster ship such as a destroyer. In 1956, year of Cold War, America produces an answer for the future. The atom-powered submarine Nautilus passed all tests with flying colors, cruising submerged to distance equivalent to circling the globe. America's sea frontiers were pushed back in a mighty leap. With increased range, guided missiles were added to the undersea's arsenal, and the submarine became a more formidable weapon of counterattack on enemy coasts. The year had indeed seen a revolutionary step forward in naval warfare and the nation's defense. White House ceremonies break the news to the world of the epic feat of the atomic submarine Nautilus. President Eisenhower personally awards the Legion of Merit to her commander, W.R. Anderson, who skippered the 1,830-mile voyage... In 1958, with great fanfare, the Nautilus completed a record-breaking voyage from Pearl Harbor under the Arctic Circle and through to the Atlantic. Operation Sunshine was the first crossing of the North Pole by a ship. ...6,000-mile shortcut from the Pacific to Europe. With the mighty Nautilus submerged for the 96-hour cruise, the voyage was a quiet one for the 116 crewmen and scientific observers. No emergencies, no encounters with fanciful sea monsters, a la Jules Verne. But always there was a sense of adventure, as the Nautilus logged a cruise that will rank with man's first strides into space in the annals of 20th century achievement. Commander William Anderson skippered the sub on its voyage that included 1,590 nautical miles submerged under ice. It was a dangerous expedition, as authorities were unsure whether the vessel's gyro compass would operate correctly under the ice. The submarine only carried enough breathing apparatus to save a third of the crew if there was a loss of oxygen. Fortunately, the sub's voyage was a success and the Nautilus made many more in future years, shattering speed and distance records. In 1959, the USS Skipjack put to sea. Even more revolutionary than the Nautilus, the nuclear-powered attack sub featured a fish-type hull, giving it unprecedented speed and maneuverability. The vessel had similar controls to an aeroplane, and its diving planes had been moved from the hull to a 23-foot sail that resembled a shark's dorsal fin. A second-generation S5W reactor gave the skipjack the ability to travel at full power from 90,000 to 100,000 miles. Its motto was Radix Nova Tridentis, or Root of the New Sea Power. The design was so effective that it was used in every US submarine until 1997.